this hearing of the <clears throat> excuse me, Subcommittee on Government of Organization Efficiency and Financial Management will come to order. First, I uh, appreciate everyone's patience and understanding with uh, both the change in time from 9.30 to 10 and also a, a slightly late start as we are wrapping up our conference meeting um, in the Capitol. Uh, the purpose of today's hearing is to continue this committee's examination of improper payments made by the federal government. In 2010, the government estimates that there are was $48 billion in improper payments within the Medicare program. This figure represents approximately 38 percent of all identified improper payments made by the federal government in fiscal year 2010 and is likely only a partial accounting of Medicare's total amount of improper payments. Medicare is considered a high-risk program by the Government Accountability Office is known to be susceptible to fraud, waste, and abuse. Last year, the Medicare fee-for-service program reported more improper payments than any other federal program. Many of these improper payments are a direct result of insufficient internal controls and financial management. The Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services process almost 5 million claims every day, relying on automated systems to identify improper claims. Most claims are paid without any individual review of the claim or the medical records associated with it. This leads to improper payments resulting from claims without sufficient documentation, insufficient or fraudulent documentation, incorrectly coded claims or services that are not deemed reasonably, reasonable or necessary. CMS has been making efforts to better identify and decrease the amount of improper payments within Medicare. In 2009, CMS filed the recommendations of the Office of Inspector General to implement stricter and more thorough methodology to calculate payment error rates. Using this new methodology, CMS identified more improper payments for 2009 and 2010. CMS is also working to calculate improper payments made through Medicare Part D, the prescription drug program. CMS has not previously calculated improper payments for Part D and will do so for the first time in the, uh, for the current fiscal year, 2011. CMS also plans to increase its oversight of Part D by performing more audits, including on-site audits and face-to-face -face evaluations. CMS has also announced that it will evaluate the fraud and abuse programs put in place by third-party insurance company administering Part D. CMS's efforts to increase oversight are certainly commendable. However, more must be done to strengthen internal controls, especially in CMS's contract management. 2006, CMS began using recovery audit contractors to identify and recover improper payments. The recovery audit contractors have identified numerous vulnerabilities in CMS's programs. Unfortunately, CMS has only taken steps to address about 40 percent of these significant vulnerabilities. GAO has also found pervasive deficiencies in CMS's contract management internal controls. GAO issued nine recommendations to improve internal controls in 2009, but a year later it found that CMS had only taken steps to address two of the recommendations. Improper payments cost taxpayers billions of dollars each year. This hearing is part of a continued effort by this committee to prevent improper payments in other instances of waste, fraud, and abuse in government. I certainly welcome the opportunity to hear from our witnesses today on CMS's progress to identify and prevent improper payments in the Medicare and would um, conclude with just a, um, a focus that given the ongoing debate with uh, deficit reduction, uh, the ongoing debate over the debt limit and the broad picture of spending here in Washington, how we need to do better with the American people's money, when we're looking at debt reduction plans that talk about reducing uh, spending by 10, 20, 30 billion dollars in the coming years, and then we look and have what we know of at least $125 billion each and every year that are improperly made by the Federal Government, almost 40 percent of which is identified within the Medicare program, we have a lot of work to do. We are grateful for the witnesses being here today who will help us in this partnership approach to getting this work done and going forward in a positive light. And with that, I yield to the Ranking Member from New York, former Chairman of the Full Committee, Mr. Towns. Thank you very much um, to Chairman Issa and uh, Chair of the Full Committee and to uh, you, Chairman Platts of the Subcommittee. 
Um, but we should be clear about one thing. Improper payments by Medicare or any other agency may be overpayments or underpayments. They may be fraudulent payments or valid payments liking proper documentation. They could also be inaccurate payments for valid charges. In today's context of a looming breach of the Federal debt ceiling, it might be tempting to view Medicare's improper payments as an easily Medicare improper payments as an easily identifiable budget savings. But that is not the case. Solving the problem of improper payments does not necessarily translate to government savings or a lower federal deficit. Still, eliminating improper payments is the right thing to do, and we should do it. I think we can all agree on that. I thank uh, Chairman Platts for holding this hearing, and I thank our witnesses, of course, Inspector General Levison and Ms. Snyder and, and Ms. Daly and Ms. King for sharing their expertise with us today. According to GAO, government-wide improper payments total approximately $125 billion in 2010. <laughs> Medicare alone accounted for nearly $48 billion of those, as my colleague indicated. That is almost 40 percent of the improper payments in the entire government. I find these figures deeply troubling and that it why we look forward to hearing from our witnesses today. President Obama has taken many positive steps towards reducing improper payments since the beginning of his administration. In 2009, the President signed Executive Order 13520, which sought to increase transparency and agencies' accountability regarding improper payments. In 2010, the President also issued two memorandums that instructed OMB and agencies to make it a priority not only to find improper payments, but to recapture the money that was paid. Additionally, the administration announced last year that the Centers for Medicaid and Medicare Services will cut the fee-for-service plan improper payment rate in half by 2012. I certainly would like to hear more about CMS's progress in this matter. Uh, Mr. Levison, the Inspector General's Office, is one of the watchdog agencies that is responsible for identifying problems and recommending solutions for improper payments in Medicare. GAO is the other watchdog. Between these two and independent innovations by CMS, I am looking forward to hearing about how and when we can eliminate improper payments. I'm encouraged at the progress that the administration has made in the last two years in reducing improper payments. Whatever it is that this committee uh, needs to do to assist in terms of the reduction, I will let you know that we stand ready uh, to do just that. Thank you very much for being here, and I look forward to your testimony. Thank you. I yield back. I thank the gentleman. Uh, members will have seven days to submit opening statements and extraneous materials for the record uh, to uh, get to our witnesses, uh, unless uh, any other member wanted to make a brief opening statement. Uh, if not, we'll, uh, we'll move to our witnesses. We're, uh, we're honored to uh, have um, four uh, distinguished public servants here with us today, uh, beginning with uh, Daniel Levinson, the Inspector General of the United States Department of Health and Human Services. Uh, he also serves on the Executive Council of the Council of the Inspectors General on Integrity and Efficiency, uh, where he co-chairs the Committee on Inspection and Evaluation. Also delighted to have Michelle Snyder, the Deputy Chief Operating Officer for the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services, where she is responsible for leading CMS's improvement initiatives for promoting excellence in operations. And from the Government Accountability Office, we have Kay Daly. Um, Director of Financial Management and Assurance for the Government Accountability Office, where her responsibilities include financial management systems, improper payments, contracting, cost analysis, and health care financial management issues. Uh, along with uh, Ms. Daly, uh, Kathleen King, 
And uh, Ms. King won't be uh, making an opening statement, but is available for uh, uh, questions as part of today's hearing. Uh, Ms. King is the Director of Health Care for the Government Accountability Office and is responsible for leading studies of the health care system and specializes in Medicare management and prescription drug coverage. Uh, pursuant to the rules of the committee, uh, all witnesses are sworn in before every hearing. So if I could ask uh, each of our witnesses to stand and raise your right hand. Uh, do you solemnly swear or affirm that the testimony you are about to give this committee will be the truth, the whole truth, and nothing but the truth? So, thank you. You may be seated and let the record reflect that the witnesses all answered in the affirmative. Um, we will um, set the clock uh, for about five minutes. Um, we do have your written testimony. It will be made part of the record. Uh, if you can stay as close to the five minutes, if you need to go over a little bit, that's certainly fine. And uh, we look forward to then getting into questions. Uh, Mr. Levinson, uh, or General Levinson, if you would like to begin, please. Good morning, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, Chairman Issa, and other members of the subcommittee. Thank you for the opportunity to testify about OIG's efforts to monitor and help to reduce Medicare improper payments. In 2010, CMS reported Medicare errors totaling nearly $48 billion. My written statement describes in more detail OIG's work analyzing CMS's error rate estimates and our targeted reviews of Medicare improper payments. My testimony this morning summarizes OIG's recommendations in this area. Although our recommendations are tailored to specific vulnerabilities, the actions we recommend to CMS fall into the following four categories. Increased prepayment and postpayment review of claims. Strengthen program requirements to address vulnerabilities. Increase oversight and validation of supporting documentation. And educate and issue more guidance to providers. OIG has consistently recommended that CMS enhance both prepayment and postpayment payment review of claims. For example, OIG's analysis of claims for diabetes testing supplies identified $209 million in improper payments. Prepayment edits can help reduce improper claims for these testing supplies. In certain areas, CMS should strengthen program requirements to address integrity vulnerabilities. For example, we have recommended that CMS establish a payment cap on chiropractic claims to prevent improper payments for maintenance therapy. We also have recommended increased review of supporting documentation to verify that requirements are being met. For example, OIG found that Medicare spent $95 million on claims for power wheelchairs that were either medically unnecessary or lacked sufficient documentation to determine medical necessity. One of our recommendations is that CMS review records from sources in addition to the wheelchair suppliers, such as the prescribing physician. Provider education is also critical to ensuring compliance and protecting beneficiaries. We found that 82 percent of hospice claims for beneficiaries in nursing facilities did not meet at least one Medicare coverage requirement, requirements that are in place to protect beneficiaries' health and well-being. Medicare paid about $1.8 billion for these claims. We recommended that CMS provide hospices with guidance on the rules for certifying terminal illness and a checklist of items that must be included in the plans of care. For our part in provider education, this year OIG conducted free training seminars in six cities to educate providers on fraud risks and share compliance best practices. We also published a roadmap for physicians to provide guidance on complying with fraud and abuse laws. And I have copies of this available this morning for each and every member. Although not all improper payments are fraudulent, all payments resulting from fraud are improper, and our efforts to combat fraud are achieving historic results. OIG investigations re resulted in $3.8 billion in court-ordered fines, penalties, restitution, and settlements in 2010. To prevent improper payments from compromising the Medicare Trust Fund, OIG refers credible evidence of fraud to CMS to implement payment suspensions, helping to turn off the spigot to prevent payment for fraudulent claims. 
Improper payments cost taxpayers billions of dollars each year. The executive order on reducing improper payments states that the Federal Government must make every effort to confirm that the right recipient receives the right payment for the right reason at the right time. OIG is committed to this goal and thank you for the support of our mission. I would be happy to answer your questions. Thank you, General Levinson. Uh, Ms. Snyder. Good morning. Thank you, Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns, and Chairman Issa for being with us today and members of the subcommittee for this opportunity to discuss the Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services' efforts to reduce improper payments to Medicare. CMS is committed to reducing the amount of improper payments and the rate and ensuring that our programs pay the right amount for the right service to the right person in a timely manner. Like other large and complex programs, Medicare is susceptible to improper payments. In accordance with the Improper Payments Information Act, CMS calculates an improper payment rate for the Medicare program annually. While these improper payments represent a fraction of total program spending, any level of improper payment is unacceptable and CMS is aggressively working to reduce errors. There is confusion about what improper payments are and what they are not. Improper payments are errors that generally result from one of the following situations. The provider fails to submit any documentation or submits insufficient documentation to support the service paid. The provider incorrectly codes the service on the claim, or the documentation submitted by the provider shows that the services provided were not reasonable nor necessary. Improper payments do not always represent an unnecessary loss of Medicare funds. Rather, they are an indication of errors made by either the provider in filing a claim or inappropriately billing for that service. Improper payments are usually not fraudulent. CMS is committed to reducing improper payments in our programs, and we have developed many corrective actions to resolve and eliminate these improper payments in the future. The traditional Medicare fee-for-service program represents the majority of Medicare spending. This program is administered by CMS through contracts with private companies that process close to 5 million claims each day, or approximately 1.2 billion claims in a fiscal year. CMS uses the comprehensive error rate testing process to estimate an improper payment rate for the Medicare fee-for-service program. Between the fiscal years 2009 and fiscal year 2010, CMS was able to reduce the improper payment rate by 1.9 percent from 12.4 percent in 2009 to 10.5 percent in 2010. The CERT program provides valuable information to assist in the development of corrective actions to reduce improper payments in the future. We believe the best way to address these documentation problems is through robust provider education and outreach efforts, performing more review of provider medical records to ensure services billed meet Medicare policies and payment rules, and enhance systems edits and automated analytic tools. Some of our recent provider education efforts include the development of comparative billing reports, issuance of quarterly compliance reports, and conducting routine forums to discuss Medicare policies and documentation requirements. We also recently implemented nationally the National Recovery Audit Program. This program allows recovery auditors on a contingency fee basis to identify overpayments and underpayments in a previously submitted and paid claim. The permanent Medicare fee-for-service recovery audit program has corrected a total of $685 million in improper payments in a 12-month period. The program also provides valuable information about areas where increased education and outreach is needed and where prepayment medical review is most productive. These tools also assist in the development of automated edits to detect and reject claims where medical services are physically impossible or medically unlikely. In Medicare Part C and D, they differ significantly from the Medicare fee-for-service program and require different approaches to measure and address improper payments. CMS prospectively pays Medicare Part C and D plans a monthly capitated payment for each enrolled beneficiary. These per-person capitated payments are risk-adjusted on a beneficiary's health status. The Part C improper payment rate in fiscal 2010 was 14.1 percent, a reduction of 1.3 percent from the fiscal year 2009 rate of 15.4. Most of the Part C improper payments are the results of errors related to the fact that the support and medical records submitted do not include the necessary diagnosis data to support the CMS risk-adjusted payment. Again, we are working very closely to implement a number of audit strategies in the Medicare Part C and in the Medicare Part D program. This year we are happy to report that in uh, November of this year we will be reporting a composite Part D rate, which will be the first time that we have reported the rate. And we believe that the information as we have gone through the establishment of that error will help us 
to start to push that error down because of what we have learned through that measurement process. We have a number of strategies in place that I will be happy to talk about as we proceed through this hearing this morning. Uh, I would also like to assure you that we are examining techniques used by the private sector, by insurance companies and others to better inform our efforts to combat improper payments. We are eager to learn from successful private sector efforts to reduce errors and improper payments and have indeed begun to form partnerships across the health care sector to ensure that we have the best information we can to make a difference in the Medicare program and to help them also learn uh, from our experiences in what is a very large payment program. While CMS has made significant progress in reducing waste and errors in our programs, we understand that more work remains. I am confident that the systems controls and ongoing corrective actions that CMS is undertaking, plus the help of our partners in the Office of the Inspector General, and in other parts of the Department will help us in continuing this undertaking that will result in continued, continued reductions in improper payments. I look forward to working with the subcommittee to ensure that CMS carries out this important work and to answer any questions that you may have. Thank you. Thank you, Ms. Snyder. Ms. Daly. Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns and other members of the subcommittee, I want to thank you for the opportunity to be here today to discuss improper payments in the Medicare program, as well as CMS's efforts to remediate them. In 2010, Medicare covered about 47 million elderly and disabled beneficiaries and had estimated outlays of about $516 billion. It makes it one of the largest Federal programs. And Medicare consists, as you know, of four parts. Medicare Parts A and B are commonly known as fee-for-service. Part C is the Medicare Advantage Program. And Part D is the Medicare Outpatient Prescription Drug Program. Now, an improper payment is defined as any payment that should not have been made or that was made in an incorrect amount and includes both overpayments and underpayments. For fiscal year 2010, HHS reported an estimate of almost $48 billion in improper payments in Medicare. And the $48 billion in estimated improper payments was attributable just to Medicare fee-for-service and Medicare Advantage. From a government-wide perspective, the Medicare program does represent about 38 percent of the $125 billion in estimated improper payments that had been reported by the 20 Federal agencies that covered 70 programs. HHS's estimated amount of improper payments for Medicare is incomplete because it has yet to report a comprehensive improper payment estimate for the Medicare prescription drug benefit. That program had reported outlays of about $59 billion in fiscal year 2010. And as uh, Ms. Snyder just indicated, HHS expects to report a comprehensive estimate for the prescription drug benefit in fiscal year 2011. It is important to recognize that the $48 billion in improper payments reported by HHS in fiscal year 2010 is not an estimate of fraud in Medicare. Reported improper, payments, improper payment estimates include many types of overpayments, underpayments, and payments that were not adequately documented. In addition, because the improper payment estimated pro estimation process is not designed to detect or measure the amount of fraud in Medicare, there may be fraud that exists in the program that is not encompassed in the reported improper payment estimate. In 2010, CMS created the Center for Program Integrity to serve as a focal point for all national Medicare program integrity issues. The CPI, as it is known, is responsible for addressing program integrity issues and vulnerabilities that lead to improper payments, and they collaborate with other CMS components to develop and implement a comprehensive strategic plan, objectives, and measures to carry out the program integrity mission and goals. CMS has also begun a number of initiatives related to five strategies that had been identified in our previous reporting. These strategies are key to reducing Medicare improper payments. However, CMS still faces significant challenges in designing and implementing internal controls to effectively prevent or detect and recoup improper payments. Effective implementation of the prior recommendations we made, some provisions in recently enacted laws, and recent guidance related to these five key strategies could help remediate fraud, waste, abuse, and improper payments in the Medicare program. The five key strategies are strengthening provider enrollment standards and procedures, improving prepayment review of claims, focusing postpayment claims review on the most vulnerable areas, improving oversight of contractors, and developing a robust process for addressing identified vulnerabilities. 
For example, having mechanisms in place to resolve vulnerabilities that lead to improper payments is key to effective program management. But our work has shown that CMS had not yet established an adequate process during its recovery audit demonstration project or in planning for the subsequent recovery audit uh, national program to ensure that re the vulnerabilities that had been identified were promptly resolved. So in conclusion, with the amount of estimated improper payments and the unknown amount of potential fraud, waste and abuse in the Medicare program, it is critical for CMS to act quickly and decisively to reduce them. As it implements recently enacted laws and, and, and other issues that have you know, brought up for Medicare, CMS has an opportunity to use new, new tools to help further address fraud, waste, abuse and improper payments in this program. So Chairman Platts, Ranking Member Towns and the other members of this committee, this completes my prepared statement and I would be glad to answer any questions you might have. Thank you, Ms. Daly, and uh, again, thanks to all of our witnesses for your testimony, and we will uh, now move into questions. I will yield myself uh, five minutes for that purpose. I um, want to first acknowledge uh, the effort, uh, Ms. Snyder, of, of CMS, and, and uh, we appreciate that you and your colleagues are dutiful in, in uh, trying to uh, um, identify and prevent improper payments and, and be good stewards of the American taxpayers' money. Um, one, um, I don't know if it's a, a caution or, or a reflection, uh, in your written testimony and, and you reflect um, uh, your statement is, uh, while improper payments represent a fraction of total program spending, any amount of improper payments is unacceptable and CMS is aggressively working to reduce these errors. Um, I would tell you just how I read that was that it's only a fraction, you know, and that any amount as if this is a small amount. Well, $48 billion is, you're right, just less than uh, or about uh, 10 percent or so of, of total CMS expenditures, uh, but that is a huge amount of money. And, and it is um, not just any amount, it is a huge amount. And, and so um, I don't want to minimize the efforts to prevent it, but you know, we are talking about when I, when I share back home that the total number for the whole government that we know of is as, uh, estimated $125 billion every year. You know, my, my constituents think I misspoke. Uh, and, and so then when we talk about an individual program, Medicare, that is uh, about 38 percent of that, uh, it is uh, staggering. Um, one of the issues in your testimony, and, and I appreciate and, and actually uh, each of you have really referenced it either uh, here today or in your written testimony, that when we hear improper payments, we think fraud, we think, you know, uh, the, the worst. And we do appreciate that that's not the case. A lot of this is just insufficient documentation, uh, in, in a, you know the wrong documentation. Um, is there an estimate of the 48 billion that is fraud uh, related, uh, either in uh, overbilling or duplicate billing or fraudulent, you know, just uh, ghost billing? Um, is there an estimate of that percent? Sir, if I, if you would allow me. Uh, before I answer that, you know, my mama is a Medicare beneficiary, and trust me, I hear exactly what you just said to me when I go home. It's it's a big number. As as his mom, and she actually uh, asked me lots of questions when she gets her her statement of uh, what is all this. <laughs> exactly. Sometimes it makes you not want to go home for Thanksgiving. Anyway, uh, but in relation to your question about a fraud rate. One of the toughest problems that we have had at CMS is to find a methodology that really actually allows us in a scientific way and in a replicable way to, to estimate what amount of the improper payments are really fraud. It is something that we have struggled with. We have gone to the private sector, we have talked to them and we have said, how do you estimate fraud? We have looked at literature, we have, you know, when people make comments about, you know, a certain amount is fraud, we have looked behind it to say, how did you measure it, because we want to do that. Uh, and what we found is there isn't a methodology. So our uh, Center for Program Integrity has started out a, a new program. They have just awarded a contract, and we are going to try to estimate levels of fraud. We are going to start with two areas that we believe are fraud prone. We know that they are fraud prone because of the good work that has often been done in terms of investigations by the Office of the Inspector General, certainly reports from the General Accounting Office. Those are our durable medical uh, equipment. Uh, areas and home health. Um, just because of the work over the years, we know that there are huge issues there. So we are hoping that we are going to be able to actually say, here is a methodology that will work 
that you can apply it to different kinds of service categories and then estimate an actual fraud rate. We hope to have that work done over the next six to eight months. We have invited the private sector in to be part of the board that helps develop this methodology. And we really hope we are going to be successful because we think this is something that will not only work for CMS, but it is going to work for the private sector as well. If we develop something if that works, we will share it. The, um, and appreciate the challenge of, of, of having that methodology to estimate. Mm -hmm. uh, do you have what your actual fraud numbers were for 2010 of, of that you found, hey, these were fraudulent? Uh, what amount, um, you know, 010 or 09 going back? Yeah, what I can do for you, sir, is send uh, in for the record. We have a number of collections. We have uh, uh, cases that went through the Department of Justice. We have investigations uh, through the OIG where we've actually collected dollars back. Uh, it it uh, amounts to, you know, many hundreds of millions of dollars um, that come from those particular cases and that are estimated. But that's a specific case. Right. Uh, that's what. Yeah, I mean, it, so, rather than yeah. trying to estimate going forward, right. what is the track record that you know is fraudulent in, in say, the last three years in 08, 09, 010? Um, you know, how much money you know was you know that yeah we know this was fraudulent because we caught the the perpetrators of the fraud. Exactly. And if you would let me submit that number that, for the record, it is in the hundreds of millions of dollars per, per year. Per, uh, probably over the three-year period. I mean, particularly we've shown recoveries from the the task forces that we have been involved with, with the Office of the Inspector General, uh, with the Department of Justice. There are particular dollars that have flown, uh, have come back to us from those stings and from those activities. Um, so it is several yeah, we, hundred million dollars over that three-year period. I don't want to just give you a wrong number, yeah. but and, significant. And, um, whatever the number is, if it is hundreds of millions, mm -hmm. we, we're, we know that that is a portion of what the actual fraud is. That is what we have caught and been able to identify. Uh, so, again, we are talking real money here that, that uh, we need to go after, in addition to the um, what I will call administrative problems with the documentation, uh, other ch types of, of improper payments. So uh, with um, I uh, yield to the uh, gentleman from New York, Ranking Member, for uh, five minutes. Thank you very much, um, uh, Mr. Chairman. Um, let me ask, uh, with the background check, if we strengthen that, you think it would cut down on the amount uh, of waste, fraud, and abuse if we strengthen the background check initially? Sir, I assume you were talking about providers who providers participate have, in the Medicare that's program. Correct. Yes. Um, that is a suggestion that has come to us. Um, again, usually I think the General Accounting Office has certainly cited that as a possibility, as has the Office of the Inspector General. And what we have found is one of the best ways to prevent fraud, waste, and abuse is to keep bad actors out of the program from the very beginning. And part of keeping bad actors out of the program from the very beginning is making sure that we do appropriate uh, provider certification and screening. And part of that is taking a look at an application and looking to make sure do you have a license? Have you been debarred somewhere else? Have you lost your license somewhere else? Um, are you indeed um, a real operation? Do you have a real billing number? So going through a number of screening criteria and doing it up front and never giving the person a, a, a Medicare provider number is one of the best ways to proceed, absolutely. Uh, we are in a process right now of where we are going to recertify the 1.4 million providers that participate in the Medicare program, and we hope to have that mostly done or at least uh, a large part, a large way underway uh, by 2013. Um, but absolutely, uh, there are certain kinds of providers where we recently have said in regulation that we do want to have the opportunity to do background checks, to do fingerprinting, um, to take a look at them through that scope. In fact, we recently have just hired a contractor who will start to take information about providers, particularly in, in um, areas where we know we have had problems and start to look at all the kinds of public information that we have about them to bring it together to take a look at it to say, is this really somebody that Medicare should be doing business with? Right. So, yes, sir, it's, it's, a, it's an excellent technique and we are employing it. Right. Sir, if I might add, um, sure. we agree that keeping the bad actors out is one of the most effective ways to prevent fraud and also improper payments in the program. And there are provisions in the Affordable Care Act that give CMS considerable authority to strengthen the enrollment process. 
and they have, in fact, separated uh, providers into different categories of risk, with home health and durable medical equipment being in the highest category. <coughs> and they have strengthened ability to, to look at providers getting into the program. And that's uh, some work that we have ongoing to look at what's going on there. Right. Let me just ask right down the line real fast, um, in the context that we're talking about this morning, correction. What does it really mean when you talk about making a correction? Just run right down the line. You must, what does it mean to you? What does it mean? You know? uh, Mr. Towns, I think the executive order states exactly what the goal is for every dollar expended, and that is to get it right. And if there is missing information, uh, if, if the record is not complete, there is simply no assurance that the dollars spent are appropriately spent. So in, in that sense, uh, it is an error. Uh, is it f necessarily fraud? No. And those are two very different concepts. I would underscore that some of the most successful, sophisticated frauds reveal no improper payment at all because the, the paper record is so well done. Mm -hmm. So while the improper payment uh, amount is likely to include uh, cases of fraud. It would be counterintuitive to think that they don't. Uh, it doesn't really capture a fraud figure. Right. Ms. Snyder. Uh, correction, I think to us, it, it's very similar to uh, what Mr. Levinson is saying, but it really means when you look at that claim that is filed, because remember we got, you know, several million of them a day just sort of going through the system that when you look behind the face of that record, what you will find is a justification for the expenditure, and that you give folks every opportunity to make sure that that record is correct before you declare it to be an improper payment. So it is a matter of, to us, it means that the service occurred, it was an appropriate service, it occurred in the right setting, and that we paid you the right amount for it. And if that's not the case, then it is an improper payment, and it needs to be corrected. You need right. to bill me correctly. You need to make sure you're providing the service in the right place. You, the provider, need to do the right thing. You are a partner with the Medicare program. Right. Ms. Daly. I would have to echo some of the sentiments that uh, Mr. Levinson and Ms. Snyder have just spoken. Uh, I think paying the bill, having the right documentation there to pay the bill, making sure the patient is in fact due for the services and so forth are all very important and all of that needs to be done correctly in each step of the process. So making it all done right the first time saves a lot of time and effort and avoids what is commonly referred to as the pay and chase mode, whereas if it is not done correctly the first time, it gets you know, considered to be a, a payable and then we have to expend a lot of time and effort to make corrections. And, 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 sir, to add on to that, I think when we talk about a corrective action, what we are thinking about is when a vulnerability has, ident has been identified and you know that people are doing things that they shouldn't, that you put a process in place to try and prevent that in the future, either by strengthening your enrollment standards, strengthening your prepay audits, or doing it on postpay. Right. Mr. Chairman, my time is expired, but let me ask you this one question here. It, um, if you have a situation where a group comes to you and say, well, this is a problem, I mean, can you make that CMS, I mean, can you make that adjustment? You know, for instance, I, I was looking at in terms of the power wheelchairs. I know there's been some issues that they've been raising over and over again, and um, which to me seems to be a legitimate kind of uh, uh, concern. But nobody is sort of responding to it. I mean, do you respond when a group comes and says this is a problem and you look at it and you see that it's a legitimate problem? Can you then make an adjustment? Mr. Um, well, let me take a stab at that one first because that's a particularly interesting one to me around the power wheelchairs. Right. The first place that we go is to look at what is the statutory requirement of the benefit, of that benefit category. How has it been defined? And for power wheelchairs, it is part of what is called a homebound benefit, right. which was established in statute, which <coughs> basically says you've got to be able to use that power wheelchair inside your home. You have to be unable to walk more than three to four steps inside the confines of your apartment, your house, whatever it may be. So if you do it, uh, you know, so when you take a look at that and folks sort of come to you and you say, well, 
Um, you know, this power wheelchair, it enhances the quality of my life because it lets me go to the mall or go to the church on Sunday or, you know, however it might allow you to get outside the walls of your apartment. That certainly is a, a valuable um, thing to the quality of that individual's life. However, if you look at the statute behind it and the legal requirements, by definition, you don't meet the requirement of the law in order for that power wheelchair to be provided to you. So it is that's a particularly tough one because yeah, on one hand you look at it and you know if you're a doctor, you know, and you're somebody's daughter, you go in and you say, My mama really could use this. It's the doctor you want to provide that. However, the ability to do something about that is limited by what is in statute in that particular example. The second place that you go is you look to see is there a regulatory policy around this? If it's a regulatory policy, is there any ability if it makes sense to make some change? Uh, and then you take a third look at it to sort of say, is this just a matter of policy that we've interpreted, that we have put something in place? So how much room do you have to work with that particular group of providers or that particular service to change it? So it's a, it's a pretty, um, I would say, a pretty rigorous process. You know, we do listen to folks. They come in. They talk to us. We look to see what makes the best sense for the beneficiary. Uh, but what makes the best sense for the beneficiary in terms of the law and regulation that are in place that sort of bound that particular benefit category. Um, one of the things we found on wheelchairs, when we've looked back at them, we have a really high error rate there, and it is pretty much for the reason that I described. It does not satisfy the definition of the benefit. Um, so we are looking at ways that we can put some, um, uh, some controls in place on the very front end of it so that we're not, again, paying and chasing uh, for um, wheelchairs, power wheelchairs then that are power mobility devices that are out there then that don't meet the, the requirements of the benefit. I think Mr. Chairman, please give a rise to this. Yep. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chairman. Or, uh, yeah. Former uh, Chairman. Former, uh, right, I gotta, right, yeah, promote you. <laughs> uh, gentleman from Oklahoma, Mr. Lankford, for five minutes. Thank you. And thank you to all of you. For what you do. My mom is also one of those Medicare recipients, and uh, people like you serving behind the scenes, she will never have the opportunity to be able to meet and say thank you, and so let me pass that on from her and millions of other seniors, uh, that what you do is a great service to a lot of people. So we appreciate that and the dedication that you put into it. Uh, let me let me mention a couple things on it that, that come back from people. And uh, the, the fraud, I, I do, I like you, I go home on Thanksgiving, that's what we're going to talk about. Uh, it's going to be Medicare fraud and friends that she has bumped into and things that she perceives to be fraud and all those things. Uh, let, me, let me flip to the other side of it. Uh, I also hear from doctors and hospitals who are very frustrated with the recovery audit contractors. There is a perception in their mind that they walk through the door and they are guilty and they are going to stay there until they prove they are guilty, no matter how long it takes. They understand they are paid by the paperwork. And so they are going to stay and dig through and find some nurse who was in a hurry who did not put the date on the form and they are going to get fined for it. And they fight and fight and fight and sometimes for years through process where this code was active and now suddenly it is not and they are getting hammered in thousands and sometimes millions of dollars in fines when they are the good providers. I am talking good hospitals. How do we fix this? Because they hate the Federal Government. Because those recovery audit contractors that walk in, they know are their enemy, and they're going to stay until they make money off them. They're not there for their benefit. Uh, they're there for our benefit as far as recovering things, but that hospital says, I'm the good guy, and how come I'm getting hammered? How do we fix that? Sir, uh, we did an evaluation of the demonstration of the recovery audit program, and I think we did identify some. Um, missteps in terms of some of the initial actions that were taken by the RACs. Uh, and it is our understanding that, that CMS has instituted a process, um, a committee inside of CMS that has to approve the issues that the RACs are going to undertake. Oh, that, that has not trickled down, actually, yet. Because I can tell you, as recently as the last couple of weeks, I have been in communication with yet another hospital in my district that is fighting through the same thing. It is a bounty hunter coming through their door, and they are determined to find something wrong. And they will. And, and they are not happy at all, uh, because they are adding a ton of additional staff in compliance areas for things that are not fraud. Uh, that they're a, they're a misstep on something, and they are they are. My understanding is these contractors are paid, even if later they determine that it wasn't true. That it really was 
correct. Is that correct? Actually, or not correct? that was the case in the demonstration, but it's not the case in the national program. Okay. Well, if that, something that's, is overturned on appeal, then the the RAC does not get paid. That's a good fix at first start on that. But how do we develop this relationship? Because they're they're no longer our friends. They're, we're setting out as an enemy to them. Um, I think one of the things that CMS is we we've heard that so. The good news is that's not new news to us, okay. but it is continuing a continuing concern and continuing news. Um, in the demonstration, which went on for three years, we did learn a lot of things, and we learned a lot better about how to manage the contractors. Uh, some of the things that Ms. King has referenced about having a committee that sort of says, okay, is this legitimate before you're going to go after somebody, uh, making it clear to the RAC contractors that if this is overturned either on appeal, whatever, you go, you're going to pay us the money back and the provider gets the money back. So it's not that you're not going to get looked at. We actually hired just recently, too, what I'll call someone to watch the RAC, a validation contractor, if you will, so that they do spot checks of the RAC's work. Uh, the particular contractors work to look at it to say, were you inappropriately aggressive? Were you looking at the wrong things? Did you really use sort of standard accounting practices? Um, I think it's really, again, a continuing education and outreach. We have regular standing forums with our provider community. One of the topics that is always on there on those calls, and we get hundreds of providers who call into those forums. We talk about the issues with the RAC program, and we have encouraged folks. We have said to them, if you think your RAC in, you know, in your area is being overaggressive, if you are having continuing problems with us, let us know. We will look into it. And in fact, in reference to the particular hospital that you just mentioned, I um, would be very happy if you will give me the name of that, of that hospital. We will reach out to them and look to see if it is just a matter of what I will call still hard feelings uh, because they don't like the program, whether or not those corrective actions have reached out in that particular setting. Um, and again, just redoubling our efforts to make sure that folks understand the intention of this is not gotcha, that well, the intention of this really is making sure, again, that we are paying appropriately. So I would be I'd, very happy to, to reach out I to that community. I would completely agree that, the, that it is a good thing for us to be aggressive in this process, but they perceive it is very much gotcha, and it is the smallest minutia that is going after with it. And uh, this hospital in particular I talked to, and I have had several hospitals that I have talked to about it. Uh, the one most recently I talked to did not want me to bring up their name on it because they feel like there will be punitive action come against them even harder next time. So they are very careful to say we are cautious on how we even move on that because they have so much power on us now and our functioning and our operation. And uh, th this is not one of your large major hospitals, but it is a good charitable hospital. Uh, that That is no way to live and to operate. And so I want you to stay aggressive on it. I want you to be able to stay on. But this system is not working for them at all. If I can add just a couple of things, notwithstanding that we are beyond your time, um, we actually will be looking at the RAC process in our office uh, later this year in the sense of looking at CMS's oversight of the RACs. And I wouldn't want my comments to be a part of some effort to say RACs are necessarily a bad idea. But as our work uh, starts in this area, uh, there, are a, uh, there are a couple of observations that are worth kind of putting into the mix as we try to understand the pros and cons of RACs. Uh, one issue is, is that the RAC process is really a variation on the model of pay and chase because the money has already gone out the door. So uh, RACs are trying to recover money. That, in a sense, uh, certainly is good. Uh, but it is a continuation of a model actually that the government is trying to get away from. You know, we are trying to catch the problems before they leave. Uh, the other is, in just the, the, uh, the brief work we have been able to do the first few years with the RAC process, RACs referred only two cases of potential fraud to CMS in the three years of the, of the demonstration between 05 and 08, even though they found a billion dollars in improper payments. So, uh, it is important to understand that the incentives need to be aligned in a way uh, so that while improper payments are identified uh, uh, in as uh, least intrusive and most productive a way, mm -hmm. uh, that it also is a process that should reveal where fraud occurs. And because the RACs don't see any money coming from identifying fraud, those cases wind up being referred for investigation. Right. We are catching paperwork mistakes and not catching fraud. There is actually fraud. a disincentive, in a sense, potentially, 
to refer cases of fraud because then they're taken out of the universe of improper payments. Uh, so I, I think these are the kinds of very important issues that need to be teased out as we, as we look at the RAC program. Well, again, I thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thank you for your um, allowing us to have a couple extra moments there. I yield back. Um, and I thank the gentleman, and, and I would uh, associate myself with the gentleman's comments because uh, your term of bounty hunter is, is um, also uh, what I hear, and, and whether it be from an institution or individual providers where they, you feel you know, that they are not, in the United States, we are innocent to proven guilty, that they are guilty of wrongdoing, and they, in essence, then are trying to prove that no, you know, that six months ago when they treated that patient, they, um, they did do it by the book, they did provide the service they were paid for, you know, yet they are put in the position of, of you know, um, of having to prove their innocence as opposed to assuming their innocence. So I very much appreciate your, uh, your uh, questions and, and comments and, and associate myself with you. And I uh, yield, yield to the gentleman from Tennessee, Mr. Cooper. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. The headline of this hearing is the $48 billion in improper payments, but already we have parsed that and we have a better understanding because apparently a relatively small percentage of that is fraudulent. But it is also possible to have fraudulent payments that are not covered by the $48 billion. I would like to ask what percent of the $48 billion are overpayments as opposed to underpayments or mispayments? Because essentially what we are doing when we put out a figure like $48 billion, we are talking about the quality of the red tape. Good quality of the red tape does not show up in that $48 billion number. But if there is a flaw in the red tape, then wham, it is in the $48 billion. So I am guessing, but perhaps I am wrong, that most of the $48 billion are still overpayments. The vast majority. Yes. So, and that is still a real concern to taxpayers. It is interesting to me that in your data, when you are comparing fee-for-service problems with managed care problems, that actually managed care problems are slightly higher at this point. And you would think with managed care you get more management and better quality red tape, but apparently that is not true yet. It will be fascinating to see what the Medicare Part numbers are, now that you are finally able to evaluate that. I think to put this in context, people also need to know that fee-for-service problems usually indicate overpayments and overutilization of services, whereas sometimes managed care problems indicate underutilization of services, denial of care. So it is a completely different human result. One injures the taxpayer, the other injures the patient. Again, to put it in context, we just had a hearing this morning regarding the Pentagon. And I think the Pentagon is still number one on the GAO's list of high-risk government agencies because they have never been auditable. After decades of trying, they are still not even close. Um, they are not even close to being able to be auditable. And when the Bowles Simpson Commission asked how many contractors the Pentagon had, the official response was somewhere between one million and 10 million. So I am in no way justifying Medicare problems, but that is astonishing incompetence when you can't tell within an order of magnitude who your payees are. Because somebody has to write a contractor a check. They don't do this work for free. Another area of serious concern is Medicaid, which is not nearly as centralized as Medicare, because that is farmed out to the states. And that gives you at least 50 different opportunities to have confusion and mismanagement and lack of accountability and fraud and improper payments. So I think one of the fundamental issues has barely been touched on in this hearing. The federal government has actually paid people very promptly under the Federal Prompt Pay Act. That is what creates this situation of pay and chase. And at least in the health care area, you have some of the slowest payers on the planet in the private sector, private insurance companies will stretch out your accounts receivable for 180 or days or longer. Meanwhile, the good old federal government steps up, pays you in 30 days. That makes the process of pre-certification so tough. But no one has ever written us a thank you note for saying thank you for paying us within 30 days. You know, they take that for granted. And meanwhile, even the GAO set up two fake DME companies and was able to scam the system. So a lot of folks in the small business community and the provider community do not want to say uh, thank you for 
coming through with payment within 30 days. But that creates a situation where we then have to go chase the improper payment. So I'm in no way defending the bounty hunters or the racks. But sometimes the federal government is an easy touch, too. And that, that balance has to be struck in a proper way. And I'm glad that you're improving your system so that you're able to get a better, better handle on that. Um, I see that my time is about to expire, Mr. Chairman. Maybe I should just stop there. Thank you. I thank the gentleman and, and uh, the first of uh, us four to actually be dutiful with the time, and it's appreciated. Uh, um, I, I would comment uh, uh, with the gentleman, though, with the, the issue of the fraud is um, we don't really know what percentage. So we don't know that it's a small percentage. We don't really know because it's not geared to uh, single out fraud. Um, it, it, we, I don't know that we can say it's a small percentage of the improper payment number. And even if it is just 10 percent, that's still close to five billion dollars uh, that would be, but we don't really know what that percentage is, and that's that's why I ask for for what's been identified as we know for certain was fraud in the past three years to to start to look at that issue, how to better identify it. So, but um, also I want um, your point about the Department of Defense is well made, and and we are looking at a hearing for the fall on DOD and issues that you touched on. So uh, we're, we're glad to, to, to uh, work with you because of, of the um, challenges GIOs well recognize it uh, at that department. So uh, with that, I yield to the gentleman from Virginia, Mr. Connolly. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. And I hope you won't get too strict in five minutes with me. Uh, uh, I want to thank everyone for being here. And I want to add to the testimony, my, my parents uh, uh, have been uh, major consumers, unfortunately, of Medicare for about 25 years. And when we were voting in health care reform last year, my dad said to me, you need to know that in those 25 years, and I'm talking major, major, major stuff, uh, never once has there been an error, never once have they, you know, sort of uh, had to be reminded to meet an obligation, never once have they arbitrarily denied something that uh, was important to us, in sharp contrast to the private insurance system. And he said, at least speaking for us, we're two very satisfied customers. It, and, and by the way, it has allowed them to, in their 80s now, live autonomous, productive lives, managing their health care, frankly, because of Medicare. And so let's remember that as a context uh, as we now look at a, a, a feature of Medicare that is not so good. And I think we have to begin with uh, accepting the fact that $48 billion is a staggering sum of money. It is unacceptable for two reasons. We owe it to the taxpayers to do something about it. It is their money. Secondly, frankly, it feeds into the narrative, which I reject, that we can't afford Medicare. What do you mean we can't afford it? If we start, if we could get 48 to zero times 10, you have got a huge significant chunk of savings in the program that doesn't touch benefits. And so it is critical that we get our arms around this. Now, nothing happens without being measured. Ms. Snyder, have we, in fact, set an ambitious goal, knowing we will never get to zero, but to get to zero? That we, that we, our goal is to get to zero, and are there milestones and metrics that allow us to do that? Uh, yes, sir. The, um, the administration has set what I think is an incredibly uh, aggressive goal. It is to cut the error rate in half by 2012. So we'd be right around 6 percent. Again, I think most folks will argue when you get to 6 percent, then it's going to be cut it in half again to 3 percent. Um, so this claim sample, I think one of the difficulties in driving down the error rate is that you put interventions in place against a sample that was drawn and evaluated. You put an intervention in place, and then within three months of that intervention being in place, you start drawing a sample again of claims. So it is the ability for interventions to actually take effect, uh, I think, is one of the greatest challenges in terms of driving down the rate. That is just going to make it tough, but we know we are on the hook to do it, and we are going to we are going to well, do our best to get there. I, I, I would simply say nothing happens without stretch goals in government. Right. I, I, I ran a very large government across the river, and uh, I, I really would like to see you come back here with very ambitious stretch goals, understanding that getting to zero is a noble goal, never attainable. But if you press the system to get to that goal, we are going to have far more dramatic and positive results. 
Um, if I could, just a, in, in response to what you're saying, quickly. Real, yes, sir, it's very important to know that probably 10 million of the claims inside the billion of claims are the ones that are the biggest dollar ones, and they're the hospital inpatients. So right. focusing there, we hear you. I want to at least sneak in two more questions. Um, one is, in looking at the data, Medicare Advantage compared to FIFA service, surprisingly, is 35 percent higher in improper payments. Why is that? Medicare Advantage, when we looked behind the numbers on that, what we found is that we pay a capitated rate. That capitated rate is based on a risk score. So in other words, inside your files, if you're a Medicare Advantage plan, you've got to be able to have a medical justification or documentation that says you're a really sick guy and I need to pay you more for it. When we started looking behind the patient panels, what we found was that there wasn't documentation necessarily that said, you're a really sick guy, so when I figure out what your capitated payment is, that it should be a higher rate. And so when we look at that, some of it was just missing documentation, similar to fee-for-service, uh, but part of it is trying to determine what the sort of the sickness score, if you will, of a particular plan and what the rate adjustment should be against the fact that the panel, the patient panel may not be as sick as reported. Do, uh, do some of the reform, do some of the measures we took in the health care reform help you in that regard with respect to Medicare Advantage? I think the risk adjustment pieces of it and knowing how to, to look inside of that uh, and those metrics that are coming out of the um, Affordable Care Act will be very useful to us. Right. We're taking those and trying to actually, through a, a series of audits, take the measurement, go back against the audit, and then figure out what the reduction in the capitation really should be so that it's a real dollar financial um, Mr. number. Ch Mr. Chairman, given your incredible generosity, would you allow me one more question? I don't think it's a long one. Um, it is uh, my uh, impression in talking to U.S. Attorney's Office says that Medicare fraud has increasingly moved up in a priority for them and consumes a lot of their time in terms of bringing, you know, charges against uh, organized fraudulent, you know, activity on Medicare. Uh, Mr. Levinson, Ms. Snyder, Ms. Daly, is, is that, is my anecdotal impression confirmed by data and what is your interaction with the U.S. Attorney's Office to ensure uh, that while we don't want to be bounty hunters, on the other hand, people who are deliberately organizing and orchestrating fraud against the United States government and taxpayer needs to be brought to justice? What's the interaction and what's the data? Uh, Mr. Connolly, the interaction is robust, and especially over the last several years as these anti-fraud strike forces have taken hold in cities around the United States, there has been a very ambitious effort to, to root out systemic health care fraud, especially it exists in places like South Florida, uh, Los Angeles, uh, parts of the Gulf states, New York, um, Detroit. And that is in large part why, uh, why you're hearing more about it, uh, more resources are being expended. It does require a careful coordination between the Justice Department as the prosecutors and OIG as the investigators. And uh, let me put in a plug that uh, this is funded uh, on our uh, part by the uh, healthcare anti-fraud account that was established in, in HIPAA and has, and has grown. And it certainly has helped us recover more than $6 for every dollar put into the fund back to the trust fund and the Treasury. Uh, so it has been uh, very uh, successful uh, thus far, and we're continuing to build on that. A very critical part of the fraud piece in healthcare fraud does have to do with enrollment, uh, making it too easy for folks masquerading as healthcare providers to get into the program, get a provider number. And Title VI of the Affordable Care Act does strengthen uh, that whole enrollment process. Uh, in a way so that if we, can, if we can get that initial piece, if we can keep the wrong people out of the program in the first instance, uh, that, that makes a huge impact, I believe, on the fraud problem in health care. Thank you very much, and thank you, Mr. Chairman, for your indulgence. Uh, you're welcome. Yo to the general lady from the District of Columbia, Ms. Holmes Norton. Thank you very much. And this hearing has been very informative if not educational, particularly when you get into what is actual fraud. I'd like to break down what overpayments really mean. Do, uh, 
do they mean cheating? Uh, do they mean miscalculating? Um, do they mean paperwork? Uh, I, I st when I when I hear overpayments, and I, if you remember the general public, that would that would seem to say somebody's putting in for too much money relative to the service provided. What is your view of that? Either any of you, Congresswoman Norton, I'd uh, like to uh, clarify that overpayments can mean all of the things you mentioned. It depend. It could be for the wrong amount. It could be a duplicate payment. It could be a payment that was made to someone who wasn't eligible to receive it. It could be someone who's eligible to receive it. Again, they received the wrong amount. It could be any number of things under contractual, statutory, or regulatory uh, you know, restrictions for that payment. So it has a broad swath there of which it can cover. Uh, well, uh, you know, I understand the, the, the limitations of statistics. Yeah. But I must say the reporting of these numbers in this way um, does add to what I think my, what Mr. Conley, Mr. Conley was referring to. When people hear a word like overpayment, they 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 reach for what, uh, of course, they they're used to that that meaning. They, they they don't even think about it in terms of their own overpayment of their credit card bill. They think the government is overpaying people who should not be paid. I would urge you. Uh, to find a category, I recognize we have to break these categories down, but to find a category that would make the public understand how much of this overpayment comes from malfeasance, from deliberate, uh, that's what I think would turn the public off more than anything else. Yes, we want the rest of it to be reported, but it does a disservice to the most <laughs> popular and perhaps most important federal program uh, it, when, especially since not everybody seems to be for that program, at least not here in the Congress, when words like that are used, and I recognize this may put a different bur uh, additional burden on you, but uh, I, I do think it's a it's a burden worth worth uh, uh, taking on, and I'd ask you to look at that. Uh, yeah. Go, Ms. King. Uh, you know, if I might, and that is a, it's a difficult thing to do because if you're talking about malfeasance or fraud, that has a legal definition and it involves a deliberate attempt. But you are at doing, wrong you, you're doing pretty, pretty well. Uh, I saw your statistics on referral uh, of cases to the U.S. Attorney, and uh, the public is interested in wrongdoing, Ms. King. I understand. Uh, yes, they're interested in mistakes too because they hold the government accountable. Uh, for being efficient. Uh, but the first thing they're interested in doing is somebody cheating us with this program that is so important to us. And I understand, and I understand how impossible it is to, to, to get a definition that meets with uh, a statistically uh, valid notion. But I just, I, that's why I only ask you to look at it. Um, I, I, I do have a question. That I was just perplexed about Medicaid Part D that in, only in January were you beginning to, was the government beginning, this is the first of these real, really large programs. Uh, I'm looking for my piece of paper that came up at me. That was the government beginning to look at overpayments or uh, for Part D, the drug program? Uh, would you please? <laughs> What have we been doing with that program, which has been, what is it, six years old? How, how that program must be. It began in 2006. Yeah. We have not been doing the same kind of, 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 of work on overpayments, underpayments, et cetera, for Part D that we've been doing for the rest of Medicare. Is, well, why don't, I, um, why don't I try to answer that? And I'm sure my. My colleagues from the GAO can help me out on this one. I don't think that we would say we haven't looked at error inside the program. What we've essentially done is spent the last three and a half, four years figuring out what it is you should report and how to separate the particular components of the measurement. In fact, we've looked at um, four different aspects of the Part D program and found error in all four of those aspects. Three of them 
which get, uh, were around like low income subsidy payments, actual computations within the system that pays the part drug benefit itself was well under a percent and a half, two percent. The area that seems to be driving inside the, the uh, Part D drug benefit, again, it comes back to if you go to the point of service where the beneficiary goes in and is going to get their, um, their um, prescription filled, what is not there at the pharmacy is supporting documentation for that order to be filled. And what we found was, in terms of the prescription drug events, that was what the biggest issue was. It was a documentation at the point of service. Uh, I think that number, I hope I have this right, was around 13 percent, and that was the biggest number inside the, the Part D. Um, but but that's, that's the same, same issue often, documentation, mm -hmm. with the rest of Medicare. In January 2011, CMS awarded a contract to identify incorrect payments and recoup payments in Medicare Part D. Now, that program wasn't paid for, unlike the health care alliance with, which we just passed. So that means the... The, the taxpayers have been really paying through the you-know-what uh, for, for this one for, 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 for errors. Uh, but I, uh, it, are, is, is your testimony that it has taken that long to develop a system uh, for doing the very same thing you were doing with the rest of Medicare? I think my testimony on that is, like any error rate program, you want to make sure that you're getting it right because, again, it is a partnership with the provider. Well, it just began in January. I mean, I commend you. Yeah. It means, well, you know, this is an administration that just, just is not has just been here for a couple of years. Uh, um, I'm not sure if in prior hearings there were reports on progress mm -hmm. to measure Medicare Part D in the same way that we measured other parts of, of Medicare. Have there been, as, as the Congressman kept informed, or did this just pop up, oh boy, this is something we ought to be looking at because we've been working on it, and maybe we ought to report it to the Congress? I think we, uh, as part of the Improper Payment Acts, we are required to report on all of our programs, certainly in terms of being a, a high-risk agency because of the mm -hmm. Medicare program generally. Any major new program that comes to CMS, we would look at it and be required to report an error rate on it. Uh, it's taken us a little while to get there. I think the good news in it is that, one, there will be a composite error rate reported this November with our audited financial statements. Could I just ask one more question on this? Will you be able to go back, or will this uh, reporting begin as of, you know, 2011 or 2010? How far back will you be able to go on, on error rates? Again, oh, I'm sorry. Just forward in Part D. Right. So, you know, that means for five or six years, people got off scot free. Uh, I understand startups, so I'm not, I'm, I'm certainly not blaming you, but my goodness, uh, you can imagine. And perhaps some of that information, some of that experience will help us to develop uh, going forward how to be better track that, that data. Thank you very much. We'll never get back that money. Thank the general lady. Uh, one uh, bright note I would highlight on Part D is when it was passed, uh, the estimates of its cost um, have been about 40 percent lower than what was initially anticipated. So uh, there is a, a positive uh, um, message out there about how that program is being operated. Um, I yield myself um, uh, five minutes for questions. I have a couple of follow-ups on, on my colleagues. Um, Mr. Lankford, in talking about the uh, recovery audit contractors and um, the uh, Ms. King, you had referenced that um, it's a contingency fee approach, but if, if what they find is overturned on appeal, then the RACs are not allowed to keep that. Um, that assumes there is an appeal made. And I guess my question is, um, what's the, you know, how easy is an appeal, do, uh, appeal done? What's the cost of doing it? What I'm wondering is if somebody's found, the, hey, you made improper payments, the, the, you know, are they going to weigh, hey, just, just give up the money, don't bother doing an appeal, so, you know, the, the rack still gets paid even though it may not have been a legitimate uh, improper payment? I am, it's sort of a tough question to answer, although I think that the RACs initially, and I would presume so in the, in the national program, are sort of going after big ticket items. So if you're a provider and it's an inpatient hospital service and there's a lot of money on the line, I would think you're more likely to appeal than not. Right. And uh, Ms. Nye, I don't know if you have anything to add on that. 
I was just going to say, um, I would, I would say that there has been a robust appeals process. Um, the provider community hasn't been shy about pushing back, and when they have pushed back, we again we've looked at it, and it has resulted in certain changes, certain edits in our system, um, to help folks actually again billing right on the front end. I mean, the ultimate with this would be if we're doing it right, moving from a pay and chase environment, you know, to pay it right to begin with. Ultimately, rack contractors would be much more limited in our um, set of, of interventions on improper payment because we'd be paying it right to begin with. Right. And, and as uh, we've talked uh, here today, one of those aspects of paying it right up front is the uh, certification of the providers, that they are legitimate you know, medical providers, and uh, the ranking member talked about that as well. And you mentioned uh, about your uh, recertifying all providers. Can you expand on what, what's that involve and how quick a process uh, is it to, to recertify all providers? Well, we're going to do it in stages. Um, we're starting out with if you're a new provider coming into Medicare, then there are those sort of more stringent requirements on the very front end. So we sort of divided it up into different groups, you know, new folks coming in, people who are already uh, Medicare providers, about 1.4 million providers. Um, what we've done is we've hired, a, again, a contractor to help us with that. We've put automated <coughs> applications um, so that people can come back in and give us their updated information, like billing places, actual physical locations, uh, all the things that help us determine whether or not you're a legitimate provider. We plan to have, we've already started on those recertifications, and we plan to have 100 percent of the community either completed in terms of recertified or significantly underway by January 2013. So there are very specific project plans in-house in our Center for uh, Program Integrity who is responsible for that activity. Uh, we've done, I think it's something like 25 uh, newsletters and articles to the provider community. We've been doing open door forums with them to say, look, this is coming. This is what we need you to do to work with them. What if um, in, in going through this process of recertification or just in general, if you find a provider who is not legitimate, um, you know, can you uh, expand on um, how you pursue them or how you work with the Department of Justice if they've been fraudulent uh, and what type of penalties usually uh, would be pursued? Right. If it's a new guy, we don't give him a billing number <coughs> or we give him a temporary billing number, which means that within three months we're going to have to make sure that they are indeed a good guy. So that's sort of like limiting um, sort of a stop loss kind of policy. Mm -hmm. So that's one of the new policies that's in place. Um, the other one is as we go through looking at recertification, we're also sending people out to do face-to-face um, visits with folks, particularly in areas where we know that there's been a, a problem. We always go back to the durable medical equipment suppliers. It's not just that we do a face-to-face -face visit with you, but we're going to show up randomly over a period of time uh, just, again, to make sure that you are indeed a, a uh, legitimate provider. The other thing that we have, a new tool that we have that we uh, are more than willing to use is suspension of payment if need be which is different than sort of the philosophy has been in the past. The philosophy for Medicare all along was we take any willing provider. Um, that philosophy now has changed because, again, as you stated so early on, $38 billion is a big number. Um, so we refer people immediately. We referred, I think it's something like 40 providers in the last quarter mm -hmm. um, over to the Office of the Inspector General to say, take a look at this. Uh, we may sometimes continue payments because law enforcement wants to build a case. Um, so there are a number of ways that we're, we're stopping, you know, payment uh, to begin with, or at least limiting the damage. One, one of the uh, issues you mentioned that uh, I think is important, that face-to-face -face and, and recognize that within your own entity, ability to go out and have a face-to-face -face with all of the 1.4 million providers, something that um, I don't know if it's ever been looked at, but uh, perhaps because it's, uh, it sounds like about a two-year process to, to go through recertification of everybody, is you know, once every 10 years, we have an entire fleet of individuals out there on the street doing the census, where they literally are walking the neighborhoods in every town, every city, every community of this country, is to partner, um, you know, and it, it's, it's a pretty simple uh, approach, but uh, that when they're in the neighborhood, if, if Medicare partners with the Census Bureau, they say, you know, we have these 10 
providers that say they're located at these locations on this, you know, this neighborhood, as you're going through that neighborhood, just go and, and make a visit to confirm that there is an entity there operating. Um, you know, it, it's, it's going to be using a resource that's already walking that street. Uh, so something that you know, we're, we're eight years away from the next or nine years away from the next census, but something that at least once every 10 years, there is somebody showing up in a provider's location and say, yep, there's a doctor's office here operating to uh, another way to compliment uh, that we're trying to weed out the bad guys. So um, the, um, on, on the outreach, uh, a lot of outreach has been talked about with providers. Um, a question, and you mentioned your mom, uh, as my mom, also a Medicare beneficiary. Um, and um, when services are provided, she gets the statement of services that were provided. And she looks down and she looks at, she, she's extremely grateful for the services that were provided and the payment of those services. Um, but she looks down that list and trying to say, well, you know, might be uh, some pills that, you know, with the cost. And she looks at the cost of all the care and, and is a little overwhelmed by how much a service was um, uh, in total cost. Is there an effort in those statements, and I um, should have paid closer attention to my mom's, that clearly says if something is not right on here, is there the easily identified 800 number? Is that part of every statement? Uh, yes, sir. It, it, you know, we have statements that run all the time on those um, notices of, of uh, <coughs> beneficiary payment that say things like, if you have a question, you know, call 1-800. One of the things that our Center for Program Integrity has just started, which has actually gotten a lot of uh, interest on the part of the beneficiary community, is we've said, if you've got a question or you think there's something wrong with your bill or you think there's something, you know, funny going on, please call 1-800, and we've set up a component within the 1-800 number to receive those calls. Great. We then take them back, and we sort of run them against the other kinds of data analysis and modeling we do to see, you know, is, is there something going <coughs> on here? Um, we've received a number of those complaints. We're logging them in, or I shouldn't call them complaints, but questions. So we log them in so that we can get back to the beneficiary and either close it out or get back to the beneficiary and say, you know, we really can't answer this now because we're going to have to take a look at a little more of it. So absolutely, that, that, yeah, there that's are partners great to hear. in this. Yeah, and, and you have tens of millions of partners out there yeah. who can help you on the front lines of identifying something that's fraudulent uh, and, and bring it to your attention. Um, final um, uh, question before I yield to the ranking member, if, if he has other questions or comments, is the um, issue of medically unnecessary services. Uh, and uh, General Evanson, um, you talked about this in your in your testimony and, and both uh, payment for services that were deemed not medically necessary. So taxpayers are paying out, uh, the be Medicare beneficiaries paying 20 percent on average for that, something they don't need, and perhaps it's even unsafe because they went through a, a procedure that they didn't need and were put at risk in getting that service. Um, you, you, um, you referenced the uh, six-month period and the, um, the uh, tens of millions of dollars of improper payments related to being medically unnecessary. Um, can you expand on what your, your recommendations were, how to try to address that aspect of improper payments and how you see where CMS is in, in responding uh, to, uh, to your recommendations? Well, on medically unnecessary, it's, it's crucial that there be the documentation in order to demonstrate that, indeed, this was exactly the kind of service or product that was actually needed by, uh, by the patient, uh, by the beneficiary. So uh, as you point out, this is a burden that is placed on both taxpayers and beneficiaries when you don't have that medical necessity determination. And I think uh, the power wheelchair example, I think, is a, is a pretty good one because there are different um, types of power wheelchairs, and obviously the more sophisticated are going to be more expensive, and if the paperwork doesn't demonstrate, and when you look at uh, the actual beneficiary, there is no reason to provide a premium uh, kind of power wheelchair that has features that really aren't necessary. Well, that's, uh, that's a cost, obviously, to the government, to the beneficiary, and it raises questions about gaming the entire system. Uh, so I, I think that's just an example, and of course, this does constitute a, a 
significant portion of the improper payments. Mr. Schneider, um, your perspective on, on that aspect of improper payments and how you are you know, trying to uh, prevent upfront, you know, rather than, uh, than chase them after the fact? Right. I think for us one of the, the best ways to prevent it is if we find those overutilization of services or unnecessary services, we take that and then translate that into an edit that goes into the front part of our payment system. We literally have over a thousand edits that are in the claims payment system. Part of those are to, to push a claim out if it appears based on a diagnosis code and the service that's being requested to be paid. If it doesn't match, it kicks it out. So again, you don't pay it. Um, the wheelchairs are a good example, but I think another really good example is, for instance, uh, people with ulcer sores, you know, with bed sores. Um, there's a special kind of what they call mattress surface. And often what we find is it's appropriate for a certain kind of mattress to be prescribed, but what happens is they go to what I'll call the deluxe mattress, the person who has really got significant uh, sores and who needs that kind of surface to do well, rather than going to uh, a different kind of surface that may be appropriate to the medical condition of that person. So it's not reasonable and necessary. There is a service that's necessary, but what actually gets prescribed for the person is not reasonable and necessary. So if we start to see kickups in payment, and this is part of the front end of our data analysis, you start to see a kick up in a particular kind of benefit category, then what you do is you start to look behind that to say, okay, what's really going on here? There should be a service of some sort, but is the intensity of the service actually one that should occur? And if we can then track that back, and we do it, you know, um, again, with all kinds of leads from all kinds of folks, then we go back and we put that edit in the front end of the system to shut it down. Okay. Thank you. Um, Mr. Towns, any other questions? Yeah. Uh, yield, yield to the gentleman from New York. Thank you very much. Um, you know, um, GAO made nine recommendations. Um, and you've actually implemented two. Is there any reason why you have not implemented the other seven, or have you responded to them in some kind of way, Ms. Snyder? Well, on that one, um, we're actually setting up a meeting with our GAO colleagues next week because when we had looked inside of it, we thought we had closed seven of the nine. Um, I think partly what has happened is we've done some internal kinds of things in terms of policy statements and some training and some development that, quite frankly, we just have not shared mm -hmm. uh, with the GAO. So we think we're a lot closer to having uh, the bulk of those recommendations closed. Um, I think, like I said, next week I think we're sitting down with them to give them uh, some documentation that we've done. We've totally rewritten a training manual. A part of this is about contractor closeout and how one audits. Uh, overhead rates, how one tracks uh, cost uh, uh, allocation systems, and a bunch of very technical contracting kind of work. Um, I think the one open recommendation that we are totally in agreement about is out of the about $4 billion worth of contracting activity we do, there was a question of about $88 million of incurred costs. When we went through those incurred cost contracts, we believe that we're really at a point that probably $86 million of that is actually allowable. We think there's about $2 million in the end that's not. We put some of those, though, in terms of what we call an interim audit sort of file to look at it where we want to do more intense looking. We really do owe GAO an answer on that. We've given them different numbers at different times as we work through that audit process. But I, I really think we're a lot closer to having the bulk of those closed, and I really look forward to, to sitting down with GAO next week and going through that. There is an internal policy document that we did not share with them that we should that is sitting right now with our Office of General Counsel and our Office of Financial Management, which addresses a number of the weaknesses. My guess is that it will get us most of the way there. I think there will be areas um, where CMS will be making a position that we believe that we are willing to incur the business risk on this rather than putting a set of resources in it. Uh, GAO may or may not agree with that, but we certainly need to sit down together and, and work through that. But I think we are closer to close than not. So, okay. mm -hmm. so um, we owe that to you. Yeah. Yeah. GAO. 
Congressman Towns, I uh, yeah, appreciate the opportunity to discuss this, and and I agree with what Ms. Snyder said. You know, some of the we had not received documentation to confirm whether or not CMS had indeed taken the actions that we had recommended related to the contract weaknesses we identified, and we are very encouraged to be um, having meetings with them to review what steps have they taken to address issues such as having appropriate contract closeouts. You know, um, uh, you know, improving their invoice review procedures, all of these things which are critical to protecting and making sure that those contract actions are legitimate. Right. And if I may, sir, I would like to add to that. Put your butt mic right. on. We really appreciated the recommendations that we got from GAO. We think we can strengthen our internal controls by acting on them and are, are, are happy and glad to do that. So we were glad to have the benefit of that review. Right. Let me just say this, you know, in talking to uh, administrators in the health care field, um, in which in, they're saying that um, electronic records might solve a lot of the problems. Do you view and feel that that's the case? Electronic records. Or will it further complicate the problem? <laughs> what will it do with the problem? <laughs> I don't think we know for sure yet. I think it's too soon to tell. I mean, certainly they're, they're going to provide better documentation, and so there should be better documentation on file. And so that would be a positive step. But I think um, before there's further implementation and we have an opportunity to look at it, I don't think we can say that it would solve the problem for sure. Mm -hmm. All right, thank you very much, Mr. Chairman. Thank you. Are you back? Thank the gentleman. Before we wrap up here, just a couple of other quick things. Uh, one, uh, just to follow up on uh, Mr. Towns' focus on the internal controls and the contract management uh, aspects as well. Um, I, I, I'm glad to hear we're, I think, further along than, than maybe we thought uh, in that area. And, and just here in the testimony today where we have recovery audit contractors now we have validation contractors to make sure the recovery audit contractors are, um, and even when there is a um, improper payments identified by the recovery audit, they don't collect. Uh, and I forget the proper term for the, um, I think Max uh, that 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 then actually do the collection. So we have a lot of contractors. So managing those contractors is key. Uh, if we're going to get a true handle of improper payments. And, and so uh, that partnership between CMS and GAO, the IG's office, is, is critical here. Uh, also, just to follow on, I won't um, kind of re-focus uh, uh, on, I guess, uh, Ms. Norton's uh, on Part D. Uh, appreciate that this is an ongoing effort that now we're in the year of really the first where we'll have a good assessment of, um, of Part D improper payments. And if we apply a rough average of, of um, the um, fee-for-service, uh, Part C, you know, 10, 12, 14 percent, somewhere in that, um, we're, we're still talking um, five, six billion dollars, perhaps, of improper payments in Part D on top of what uh, has already been identified. So all the more important that uh, that effort move forward as it is, and, uh, and we're dutiful in how to address those. So, um, in, in wrapping up, I, I guess I would emphasize uh, one, what I think just about all of us have hopefully conveyed is uh, the importance of what you do and the gratitude of our constituents for Medicare ensuring that our seniors are getting uh, the medical care that they need and uh, that um, you know, we do right by them. And, and we certainly want to uh, recognize CMS for their efforts in ensuring that's the case. Uh, and also the partnership between really all three entities represented here, CMS, IG office within the department, uh, GAO. Um, I hope that the three of you and your entities, your, your offices, will see this committee uh, in a very um, positive partnership manner, because uh, that's really what the, uh, the intent of this hearing is, is, um, again, I think, uh, Ms. Snyder, you referenced it about not playing gotcha. Uh, that's certainly not what Mr. Towns and I um, I sometimes forget uh, the references because uh, I've been chairman with him as my ranking member on two occasions now. He's been chairman with me as his ranking member. The bottom line is uh, we have a shared focus, which is just to have good government and to partner with all of our colleagues in government to achieve that. 
and, and so that's clearly, um, I hope, comes through what our intent is at this hearing and going forward to continue partnering uh, and, and how we can further partner um, in, uh, in the months and years to come, especially if there's legislative issues. And um, one that was mentioned uh, uh, where uh, statutory language uh, with the uh, power wheelchairs uh, and how you have to start there. Um, and if there are issues that you identify at CMS that, um, that perhaps the intent of Congress is not fulfilled uh, uh, accurately or, or, or uh, appropriately by the way the statute was written versus what you think we were trying to do, you're probably going to learn of that before us uh, because of implementing uh, the statute, is to come back to um, our committee or uh, you know, uh, Ways and Means uh, and uh, energy and commerce with Medicare and Medicaid, um, but to, to again partner with Congress, um, and that's what we're uh, hoping to do um, in every aspect. And at the end of the day, as far as this subcommittee's focus, is that um, uh, we do our best to uh, ensure that every dollar of the American people's hard-earned funds that are sent to Washington are handled and used in a responsible, accountable fashion. I know that's what all three. All four of you, uh, as uh, as um, public servants, are after, uh, and uh, we um, are appreciative of your efforts and look forward to going forward in a positive way with you. Uh, we will keep the record open um, for uh, for seven days for any additional information. Uh, one specific is that those numbers on fraud uh, that are actual fraud dollars that have been identified in the past three years uh, that would be great, and um, you know look forward to continue both uh, at the committee level with members as well as with our staffs in how we can work with you. So uh, with that, this hearing stands adjourned.